Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today on my channel about Norse language and myth, I'm going to inaugurate a new series of Old Norse lessons for people who are trying to learn how to read the language but don't have access to a class or who perhaps uh, maybe have taken a class at some point and want some kind of refresher or just someone's different style of teaching. <laughs> A long time ago, when my channel was young, one of the first things that I did with it was offer a series of Old Norse lessons. But those videos uh, gradually displeased me for one reason or another, and I got rid of them and replaced them with some videos that are basically just reference lessons, right? I have a video about how nouns work, a video about how verbs work, etc. But nothing that's supposed to kind of guide you in piece by piece uh, with the goal of helping you read the language. Um, in, in, in something like the order that somebody actually learning a language um, natively would learn it in, right? You know, how, putting the pieces in order, um, not necessarily all nouns and then all verbs, but what are some very common words of whatever class, learning common vocabulary first and expanding from there. Um, I cannot run this like an actual class. I do not have the time to respond to to everybody's questions or to personally tutor people. However, if you are on Patreon, you are welcome to reach out to me on Patreon um, for exercises related to the content of each lesson, uh, for checking your work about different things. That, that sort of thing is, is fine. So with the caveat that this will never be perfect, um, but that it may at least help me in sketching out my future textbook uh, for self-study in Old Norse, let's start working on teaching you Old Norse. Now, I am going to focus on reading the Eddas, because that's what everybody actually wants to read. Back when I was teaching Old Norse uh, three years in a row in a one-year uh, sequence at UCLA, I found that people surprisingly got kind of bored with the sagas. Uh, not that I think they're boring, but that other people did. People want to read the myths, so that's what we'll focus on. So the vocabulary and grammar that I'll present will be kind of aiming at getting you to where you could read parts of uh, the prose edda, and then eventually, depending on how long I can keep this going, uh, reading parts of the poetic edda as well. So let's get some basic pronunciation stuff out of the way first. I like to present the 1200s pronunciation of Old Norse because this is pretty easily reconstructable by linguists today, and it corresponds to the time period in which most of our literature in Old Norse was written down, which is in the 1200s in Iceland. This pronunciation is not identical to modern Icelandic. Often, when Old Norse is taught, it is taught with modern Icelandic pronunciation. To me, it's anachronistic. You're never going to use Old Norse to talk to people in Iceland anyway, and it's a lot easier to learn the Old Norse pronunciation, so why not stick with that? A few major things to point out. Your basic five vowels, your A, E, I, O, U, are going to be pronounced fundamentally like in Spanish, a, e, i, o, u. When you see a acute accent above the vowel, that basically means that it is held longer. So, e, i, o, u. This may seem strange to you if you haven't thought about it before, but actually in English, we do have words that are distinguished by length. If you look at the word hat, that is a short a vowel whereas had is a long vowel, hat, had. So you are actually capable of distinguishing these things. And it does sometimes make a difference in identifying words in Old Norse, whether you've got a short vowel or a long vowel there. The exception to that is the long a, which instead of being a ah, by the 1200s is certainly o, it's a rounded vowel, uh, which is what you get in modern Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, and the descendant of that vowel, which is written as a with an o above it which is, uh, it's, it's historically an A, but it sounds like an O now. So pronounce that as O. So for instance, words like O, then, O, on, so, so, are pronounced with the A vowel, but round your lips, O. It's kind of like the vowel in a North Jersey pronunciation of coffee, or a little bit, if you have a different geographical orientation, a little bit like 
saying road in perhaps a northern Wisconsin accent. There are other vowels as well in Old Norse. We have ash, the vowel that looks like an A and E together. We have the vowel that nobody can agree on a name for, the O slash. And we have the hook O or O caudata. Now, ash is pronounced ah. O slash, <laughs> I'll call it, is pronounced like the uh, O slash in Norwegian or Danish, or the O with two dots in Swedish or German. Or, if you're not familiar with any of that, think about Arnold Schwarzenegger saying bird. It's a bird. It's that sound. Uh. Then the hook O, or O cow dada, that is the same sound as the long A, but short. That's that short, that's that rounded A sound, oh, like coffee. Then you also have the vowel Y, that's pronounced like the dude vowel. If you think about a California surfer saying dude, he's not saying dude, he's saying it further forward in his mouth, he's saying actually dude, that is the vowel. It's like the U in French, or the U with two dots in German, if you're familiar with either of those. F will be pronounced F only at the beginning of words, like in the name of the dragon, Fulfnir, or if doubled, which you're not going to see very much. Mostly F is going to be pronounced as a V. So words like av, from, or hav, si, or ev, if, that F is pronounced as a V. And in modern Scandinavian languages other than Icelandic, that's actually written as a V. So, for instance, the Old Norse word hav for ocean is written H-A-V in modern Norwegian. So, remember the dragon's name, Fulvnir, and you've got quite a few of our basic things to keep in mind there. F is F at the beginning of a word, a long A is a rounded sound, O, and then F otherwise is a V sound, Fulvnir. R is a trilled R. Doesn't matter a whole lot, there's no Old Norse speakers for you to confuse this way, but it would probably sound like a... Uh, Scots R, or a Spanish R, probably not as long as Spanish R often is, er. Um, R can often be its own syllable. It is very often its own syllable. So, for instance, in the name of a god like Baldr, or in a word like after, again. Notice, by the way, that in after, I'm pronouncing the P, something like what you'll hear as an F, but actually I'm pronouncing it as a bilabial fricative. It's a little bit more like... Uh, I'm putting, using both of my lips, but I'm pushing the air through like it's an F. Af, tr. But there's not a whole lot of P's in Old Norse anyway, and that only applies to P's before T's. After, oft. Anyway, baldr shows you that syllabic R. So the R is actually the whole syllable. That isn't too different from English where you have words like water, where the R is actually the second syllable for most American English speakers like myself. S is always actually just an S. It's never a Z sound. And then you have special letters, thorn and ev. Thorn looks like a P with an extra bar above it. Ev looks like an O with an X above it. In origin, thorn is actually the runic letter thorn, and ev is a medieval D which is curved with a bar through it. Thorn represents the TH sound in thin or in cloth. Ed represents the TH sound in then or in clothe. So a difference is voicing. If you put your fingers on your vocal cords and you say the S sound, like you're a snake hissing, and then say the Z sound, like you're falling asleep, go back and forth between those. Your vocal cords vibrate when you make the Z sound, but not when you make the S sound. That's the same difference between thorn where your vocal cords are not vibrating, and ed, where they are. This is the difference between thin and then. Or remember that thor is spelled with a thorn in Old Norse, and weather, weather, is spelled with an ev in Old Norse. Keep in mind that the emphasis or stress in a word is always on the first syllable, no matter how long it is. So the name of the Valkyrie is Brynhildr, not Brynhildr, Brynhildr. The name of the primordial void before creation is Genungagap, not Genungagap or something like that. The stress is always on the first syllable. Some Icelanders today uh, tell foreign learners uh, of Icelandic, which maintains this rule, 
that you shout the first syllable and you whisper the rest. And sometimes that can help people learn how to do this in Old Norse too. So there you have some basic pronunciation rules. I have more detailed videos about this, probably some of which need to be updated. Uh, but that'll help you understand why I'm saying some of the sounds that sound a little different, uh, perhaps than English speakers or other modern language speakers uh, would expect. Now after a short break from my sponsor, I'll look at some of the basic vocabulary you ought to learn before proceeding with the next lesson. The way that I'm going to set these lessons up after the uh, somewhat chaotic attempt at presenting pronunciation in a fast way is I'll give you some vocabulary in each lesson and I think you ought to learn all of that vocabulary by heart before moving on to the next lesson. It will really help once you start reading, which I would say five or six lessons into this, I'll start showing you some short text on the screen and letting you test yourself. Um, the more vocabulary that you can just call to mind right away, the less you're flipping through dictionaries, and that's always gonna, gonna discourage you from, uh, from continuing on. You've gotta put in that memorization work at the beginning, especially for the words that you're just gonna see all the time. So in this video, the vocabulary I'm gonna present is vocabulary you never have to worry is gonna change. There's a lot of inflectional morphology in Old Norse, where it's changed their endings depending on what they're doing in a sentence. I want you to start with the words that don't so that whenever you see these, you can confidently say, I know what that means. Let's do these in alphabetical order. Aldri, never. Aldri. After, again. After. At, that. Not every meaning of the word that in English, but if you learn to read at as that, you'll be in good shape. At. Other, before. Other. Braut. Away. Braut. Notice that the AU diphthong sounds roughly like in German. Either. Or. Either. That's related to English either, if you need something to anchor it by. Eigi. Not. Or don't. It's the negative word. The no or not word. Not. Ehi, ek, I, ek, like I, me. N, but, N. Er, now this word actually means three different things. And one way you can remember the three things it means is to remember this short little sentence. Eric gang, that eri. Theri, excuse me, Eric gang, that eri theim skom, Eric valda. Eric gang, that eri theim skom, Eric valda. Now in that sentence, er is being used in all three of its major ways. It means, this sentence means, when I walk, it's in the shoes that I chose. So, er means when. Er ek gang when I walk. It means is that er i themskom is in those shoes. And it means that or which in a relative sense. Er ek valda, which I chose. So er means is, it means when or where, and it means who, which, or that in a relative sense. I am the one who knocks, <laughs> the who is er. All right. Han, he, han, hevan, from here, hevan. That goes with her, which means here, like at here, and hingat, which means to here. So I come from here, hevan. I'm standing here, her. Come here, hingat. That is equivalent to from there. Thar, 
there, at there, and thangat, to there. You come from there, stadan. I used to be there, thar. Go over there, thangat. What, what? Now, mostly I pronounce V in Old Norse as a V, but I do believe that after another consonant in the 1200s, it was still a W sound, but only after another consonant. So that what sounds roughly like older American English, what, uh, where you actually have that H pronounced. What, what? Huersu, how? Huersu. Illa, bad. Illa. Nyok, very. Nyok. Nu, now, nu. Uk, and, uk. Swo, so, swo. Var, was, var. Vel, well, vel. That, it, that. That is, of course, cognate with English, that, and it can mean that as well, but you'll mostly read it as it in Old Norse. Tho, then, tho, and tho, tho, tho. Now, that may seem like a lot of vocabulary to start with, but in fact, that's a pretty good chunk of the really basic words you're going to see all the time. And if you memorize those before we ever go forward with the really complicated stuff, again, by the time we're reading, you'll be in good shape. Now, let me give you just a little exercise. I will give you um, a couple sentences that I'm pulling out of the uh, Saga of the Inglings by Snorri Sturluson, so it's mythical material, although not his prosetta. Translate it into English, and I want you to fill in the blanks of the words I'm going to put in parentheses on the screen. Uh, with the correct Old Norse word. And if you're on Patreon, you can send this to me and, and I'll let you know if you did it right. Odin was a great warrior and very wide traveled and came to own many kingdoms. He was so victorious that in every battle he got the advantage and so it happened that his men believed that he had assured victory in every battle. It was his custom, if he sent his men to battle or other errands, that he would lay his hands beforehand on their heads and give them bread. They believed that it would then go well for them. If you can fill in the uh, words and that I put in parentheses in English with their Old Norse uh, equivalents, again, you are doing well with this vocabulary lesson. Now, before I hang up on you and we wait till lesson two, let me just say that if you're seriously trying to learn a language, you need to practice it every day. It makes a lot less difference if you spend a few hours going crazy for this once a week, you will make less progress than somebody who steadily takes 15 minutes every day to review, even when they find the subject boring, especially maybe when they find the subject boring. That's how you learn something, is that constant exposure. There's nobody to speak Old Norse with, so what we're ultimately going to work on again is getting to where you can read, and again, you'll be in the best position to read if you've got all that most basic vocabulary right at your fingertips weeks before you ever see a text. All right, so that's the fairly easy stuff. In the next lesson, we'll get into grammar, and that's not so easy. For now, from the most beautiful part of the world, the San Juan Mountains of Southwest Colorado, I am wishing you all the best. The whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books, is to bring good information about these subjects to the people who want it in the places where they're looking for it, online. Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. 
the people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people sh trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories it, and, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you help me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the Great Rocky Mountain Outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best.